microtransactions. A staple of basically every game in recent times, those little pop-ups trying to sell you worthless video game items for real money, sometimes even in games you've already paid full price. So what if I told you this horrible feature of modern gaming was all started by a TF2 update? Well my name is Cross, and today I'm going to teach you how the entire gaming industry was changed by a single update to a Valve game over 13 years ago. A little context. When Team Fortress 2 first released in 2007, there was no such thing as hats, which might seem insane to anyone playing now, they're such an integral part of the game. But in the Sniper vs Spy update of 2009, cosmetics were first added to the game, giving one class, one hat each. And these caught on pretty quickly. The hats were flashy, but only stood out just enough to be noticed. It also led to a bit of a condescending attitude from these hatted people towards the non-hatted Irish. However, the only real way you could get one of these hats was through random drop, and anyone who ever played TF2 knows how rare they are. For example, I've played for over 1,500 hours, and I've only gotten 3. This increased the rarity even more, and there is no way of sharing these hats with friends or selling them to others. We had to wait a bit longer for that, but eventually, September 30th, 2010. The Man Economy update dropped and it was huge. So many staples of TF2 were added in this patch. Trading, some of the most popular hats in the game, the Manco store, unusuals, even more hats. And people started to notice that these hats could hold some actual value. Suddenly, unusuals were worth like $20, which seemed insane at the time, but it kept going up. A more valuable hat and effect combo started to cross the $100 threshold. Well, let's look back at TF2. See what's changed since Man Call Me update. This is called a trade server. It's a bit crazy. Playing the game instead of sucking down estrogen milkshakes, you would do better. This is where most of the TF2 training took place. People would discuss possible trades, spam binds with the hope of selling weapons, and play a lot of sniper. These goofy little communities became essential to the growth of trading in the economy. Sure, this update has been influential to TF2, but how has it affected the whole gaming market? The thing is, trading these hats for real money required you to use a middleman, like PayPal, and run a huge risk of being scammed. Valve knew they had to do something about this, so they went and added the Steam community market. Now you could trade hats for Steam balance, with Valve taking a little chunk of course. Now the hats had a reliable market to use, people started spending a lot more money. This was a gold mine for Valve. So they kept adding more and more hats, and the hat prices kept going up and up. And as more hats were added, the art styles started getting even more blurred. You can see how the game was meant to look in the massive amounts of concept art released by the Valve developers. But as time went on, the bar kept getting lower. Holiday events made this problem even worse. For the past few years, don't expect to go through any Christmas or Halloween case without seeing some shitty Christmas tree or pumpkin cosmetic. And along with that, we have unusuals, with every new generation getting worse and worse. As time went on, things had to get more flashy for people to keep buying them. Everything had to stand out. And with an economy getting so big, some more sketchy websites had to start showing up. And I don't endorse gambling in any form or medium, but in a kid's game, I still have no clue why this is legal. But you're going to see a lot more of it. So after the huge success that was the TF2 economy, Valve started to add this crate system to another huge game of theirs, Counter-Strike Global Defense, better known as CSGO. On the 14th of August 2013, Valve dropped the arms deal update for Counter-Strike. Remember how crazy I said TF2's economy was? Was CSGO's one? Just a little crazier. TF2 is a very popular game, but it pales in comparison to Counter-Strike. So the CSGO economy rose to a level much higher than TF2's, much quicker. Not only was this really helpful for people trying to make money playing their favourite game, but they were also very profitable for the game developers, with Valve making tens of millions monthly. But CSGO cases were a little different than TF2 ones. Valve made sure that everything looked as attractive as possible, and people bought into it. And up to today, millions of cases are being opened daily. Yeah, millions. 
in April of this year alone, over 50 million cases were opened. And that number traditionally increases towards the summer, so let's see how big this gets. Also, seeing how each key costs $2.50, did you need one to unbox each case? We can guess that Valve makes $200 million a month purely off case sales, completely disregarding the 15% they take for all sales in the Steam market. So Valve is easily making $200 million monthly, which might seem weird because CSGO is free to play, and most games that are pay to play make nowhere near this amount of profit. The thing is, although most people don't spend money on free to play games, the few that do, spend a lot. 46% of revenue for free games comes from just 10% of players. And that's when other game devs caught on. Suddenly, every game started to copy this format. And then there was the gambling. A game with an economy this big was sure to get burnt to a few sketchy websites. I will soon have to sell my house. Win and buy a new house. Cisco's gambling sites were particularly harmful, because unlike most sites, these ones weren't using real money, just in-game items. Of course, that isn't gambling, that's just kids playing around with some worthless video game items. Worthless video game items. And CSGO YouTubers definitely did help to grow with this. <laughs> but can anyone really blame them? The amount of money those people must make from sponsors is insane. But something that Almaxo said about these a while back really stuck with me. The money you gain is out of your fans' losses. Anyway, Fortnite. One of the biggest games ever made used this free to play model with optional cosmetics, and it definitely worked. When Fortnite took over the world around 2018, so did its revenue, making about $5.5 billion annually at its peak. Another thing that worked in Fortnite's favour is how free to play players were taught about in the community. This also led to a bit of a condescending Yeah, attitude. yeah, you've heard all this before. Let's skip to the good part. Everything had to be more and more flashy more and more crazy or else people wouldn't buy it. Gone were the days of basic two colour reskins and normal looking pickaxes. Everything had to stand out. And slowly but surely, you could see this once iconic art style decay. The lighting changed, the design of the maps started to look a little different, and all the buildings started to be designed to match this new art style, and people started spending a lot more money. This marks how the Fortnite style microtransactions completely changed the game. You're paying less money through the gate, but in the long run, the house still wins. But all of these things happen in TF2 first. The external marketplace, the divide between players, the decimation of a once iconic art style. We saw this all originally in TF2. And that's how this entire microtransactions wave started. That's how game devs and gamers started getting exploited by major companies. And that's how a single TF2 update back in 2010 changed gaming forever. Thank you, good luck, and boo loop.